Welcome to the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Norris. We're going to grow your leadership through neuroscience, psychology, and theology. Welcome, everybody, to the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast. On today's episode, I'm going to share with you the components of self-differentiation. Now, last week in episode number 92, I shared with you an overview of self-differentiation. Differentiation is really a human flourishing code cracker. Without it, a leader, whether in a corporation, a church, a team, a family, is going to feel like an invisible virus is lurking somewhere in the shadows, unidentifiable, yet continuously weakening the results of the organization. And the leader doesn't know what it actually is. You really owe it to yourself to go back and listen to episode number 92, The Leader's Kryptonite, Emotional Fusion versus Differentiation. Well, in review, self-differentiation comes from Dr. Murray Bowen's family systems theory. He developed it to help couples manage anxiety, conflict, distress, detachment. Uh, The principles that he has used has helped thousands of marriages and even individuals who were at their wit's end. The family systems theory has been adopted in organizations all around the world, much with the work of Edwin Friedman in his book, A Failure of Nerve. What he posited was that organizations have personalities just like families do. And to apply the insights of family systems theory and therapy to companies, churches, synagogues, and schools, there could be an incredible outcome. He was suspicious Uh, of all these quick fixes that sweep through the wider culture and leadership best practices. His works argued for self-differentiation as a key mark of true leadership. Friedman's formula for success was for more maturity, primarily in the way a leader differentiates, rather than more data, technique, or even hard skill competency growth. In short, The same reality that we experience in family systems, we also experience in church systems, business systems, military systems, and friend systems. Bowen presented that those stressed out states, the burned out states, the give up states are not due to overworking or lacking competency, hard skills, but it's due to unresolved fusion or enmeshment issues. A person's inability to self differentiate and therefore an inability to self-regulate, which is a reference to the emotions kind of getting loose and running away like a wild freight train. So the definition, let's come back to what is self-differentiation? It is the ability to define, hold on to, and regulate one's own beliefs, values, goals, and emotional states in the midst of surrounding togetherness and even under pressure. Again, I want you to consider this definition, the ability to define, to hold on to, and to regulate one's own beliefs, one's own values, one's own goals, one's own emotional states in the midst of surrounding togetherness. And of course, that references this external pressure to conform. It's this understanding that there's always pressure to conform in any system, whether it's a family, a congregation, a corporation, even a nonprofit organization. It's the awareness that there are these surrounding togetherness pressures that actually drive us. They pressure us to conform. And I can say for me personally, as a senior leader in the church world, as a pastor, a conference speaker for over 35 years, I can actually say with tremendous confidence that the underground issue of most, if not every issue from depression, anxiety, rage, to parenting and marital distress, to work and professional conflicts, to church griefs and losses, is the immaturity of emotional development in self-differentiation, all the way from the leader through the organization. Even after clients, clients that I work with have become psychoeducated and aware of the dynamic of self-differentiation, It's still a competency skill that has to be developed, and people continue to struggle, though they grow and get so much better, but they continue to struggle 
to see the enmeshment or this fusion of emotional pressure. Now I've got to feel what you feel. I got to experience what you experience. If you're mad at me, I have to pause and emote that. I have to absorb that. And in the enmeshment or fusion that happens in real time in these relationship systems, you find a high potency of anxiety. We looked last time at biblical foundations. I think even about how Adam, God creates man and he names him. Why would you name or label an individual? Because they are an individual and it separates them from other names and individuals. In other words, God starts the whole human race out with an identifier that you are not somebody else, that you are you. And this gives us the beginning of differentiation. I think about how the Trinity, this mystery within Christianity of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit being one, this complete community between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all of which names are differentiating each part or each person in the Godhead. And so we know that the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, the Holy Spirit's not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit. These are three persons in one, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What are we talking about? We're talking about differentiation. This is a clarification of who a person is and who they aren't, and where they come to an end when it comes into relationship of somebody else's own emotional states, experiencing, and the projections of pressure that they may put on another individual. And then, of course, we looked at salvation, even salvation, this eternal gift of God's grace that we could be restored in full forgiveness and then spend an eternity with God the Father through the gift of Christ's work of redemption. Well, this is an individually defining belief. This is something that each one of us believe, and we are accountable for our own individual choice and acceptance of the gift. In other words, it's not a group accountability. Why do I say that? Because again, I'm trying to emphasize that differentiation is founded in the individual boundary of who a person is, who a person is not, and then from that boundary, we have accountabilities. This is all through scripture. I gave you the scripture in Matthew 16, 19. Jesus says, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Some translation says, whatever you allow on earth, heaven will allow. Whatever you will not allow, heaven will not allow. In, in other words, this is, again, a key to the kingdom of heaven. How the kingdom of God operates is around a sense of an individual, a sense of a choice of a person. It isn't group identity here. In fact, you can't even have a group identity until you come back to the individual identity. God creates Adam. Then Adam and Eve come together and they make a family. So before you can have a family, you have to have two individuals. And then the family begins to join with other families. And before long, you have a community and you have a city and then you have a nation. And then one nation is named differently than another nation. And rather than this generalized globalism, what you have is this narrowing down of different groups until you get to an individual. So even as a group, you have to be able to function where I know as a group who we are and who we're not, what we want and what we don't want. And if we don't understand that, then we're going to actually take on the emotions, the pressures of culture, society, and so many other factors that are in this world. One of my favorite scriptures around differentiation is the idea of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, when Paul the Apostle talks about that now indeed there are many members, many members talking about a local church. There are many members, yet there's one body, the body of Christ. Now you are the body of Christ and you are members individually. That's the new King, King James Version. Again, there are many members. What's that? Individuals. This is differentiation. I'm not you. You're not me. We're not all blended together. We're not fused. We're not enmeshed. I know who I am. I know my function. I can't even say to other parts of the body, I don't need you. Why can I say I don't need you? Why, why is that not appropriate? Because the fact is, is when I stand in my individual differentiation, 
I then can be connected to other individuals. And the body of Christ is fundamentally made up of many members, yet one body. So the question begs us, how do we mature? How do we mature in self-differentiation? Let's review one more time the definition of differentiation or self-differentiation. It's the ability to define, to hold on to, to regulate one's own beliefs. I know what my beliefs are. I know what mine are, and I'm discovering what yours are. But I know what mine are. And what you believe does not need to change what I believe unless, in truth, I can say you're right and I need to believe what you believe about it. But you know, often that's not what happens. So often we are frail in our sense of self. Our identity is so pliable that when somebody believes something different than what we believe, we don't know where we begin and where we end. We don't know what we believe and what we don't believe. And so our identity and lack thereof prevents us from actually being healthy, flourishing, differentiated humans. Once again, the definition is the ability to define and to hold on to and to regulate one's own beliefs, one's own values. Somebody comes along and says, your values are not right. You are this, fill in the blank. You are this uh, moniker. You're that moniker. You, there's all these phrases and terms are used. Your values are wrong. You, you don't see the world right. You're not progressive enough. And right on down the line. Well, in differentiation, I'm abil- I have the ability to define what my values are, to hold on to what my values are, to regulate around what my values are. And if somebody disagrees, I can recognize, recognize that you're not me and I'm not you. You have different values than I do. And if a person is in distress around disagreement with my values, then they're the ones in distress. I can stay connected with certain boundaries. If they become toxic, I don't have to enter into it. If they become uh, acoustic, I can build boundaries. I can move myself out of that space. I, I can be Uh, in multiple different variations, building responses as to what I want to do to keep myself safe, but I don't have to compromise my identity, my values. And that's true, not only of beliefs and values, also goals, where I want to go in life. And even in family systems, you'll have people who are wanting you to have a different goal than what you have as a goal. In church life, you have congregants who come and they want you to have a different outcome in the church and they want this ministry and they want that program and they they want these things that ultimately have a goal outcome that's different than what you as a senior leader want. And so you have people who are pressuring in the togetherness system, pressuring you to conform to what it is that they desire and that they want. And so often I can tell you, for me, this is where I had a very, very big difficulty. It was a difficulty for me to, for one, stay in my sense of self, to be in my differentiated identity, and yet at the same time, intentionally stay connected to emotionally stay connected to the person without absorbing all that would be projected onto me. You know, my... Uh, Go to kind of my instinct, my armor up is that when people attack me and I feel rejected or betrayed, if somebody is coming against me with a big energy, big personality, and they are trying to get me persuaded to own what their energy is, I, I find myself in a desire to be differentiated. I find myself deciding to disconnect or to detach from them. And that's where the weakness happens for me. We'll get more into that in a minute. But our ability to define, to hold on to, to regulate around our own beliefs, our own values, our own goals, and get this, our own emotional states. So I can regulate my emotional state when people around me, the togetherness, this external pressure is coming on me. I can continue to hold on to myself even in the midst of surrounding togetherness and this pressure that could be being given. When we talk about this definition of differentiation, Dr. Murray Bowen, the founder of the family systems, he defines it this way. It's the degree of resilience to the interpersonal contagion of anxiety. I want you to consider how this breaks down. 
There is an interpersonal contagion of anxiety. In other words, anxiety is contagious. In other words, it goes viral. In other words, whenever you have a group sitting around a boardroom table, whoever has anxiety in the room is going to spark the anxiety around everybody else. And the entire meeting can get hijacked on the basis of a person with anxiety. Now, when you think of anxiety, you may be thinking of a person twiddling their thumbs, patting their leg, somebody who's in panic. But I want you to consider that anxiety, as Dr. Murray Bowen would describe it, is simply the distress or the angst for a person to get what they want. Anxiety shows up in ways of, this is the program, this is the direction, this is the values, this is what I want us to do. And if that person is not a collaborator in the group, what's going to happen is they're going to amp their energy up to get others around them to buy into their anxiety. And so that anxiety becomes a contagion. And then everybody's like, we got to do this or everything's going to fall apart. We got to do this because there's consequences. Maybe the consequences only that I'm going to lose connection or relationship with Billy Bob, who has all the anxiety coming out of them. I don't want to disappoint them around the table. So there is an interpersonal contagion of anxiety. You see it in families. You see whenever a dad or a mom or a child or a sibling, you see all of these different players who are in a system and somebody is going to bring into the environment an anxiety. They don't like something. Something's not the way that it's supposed to be. And now it's not just about direction. It is about this higher energy, big personality. And when that takes place, everybody in the family system begins to adapt with whatever system internally, with whatever processes that they've learned, they adapt to whatever that big energy is. And so what Dr. Murray Bowen says about this interpersonal contagion of anxiety, he says, to define differentiation, it is the degree of resilience, the ability to be resilient around interpersonal contagions of anxiety that are in the relationship system. And you'll have somebody who sparks the fire and then other people who start building fires off of that fire. And they'll have anxiety. Sometimes it's conflict fighting. Sometimes it's shutting down. Sometimes it is the escape into certain uh, addictive type or dysfunctional disordered behaviors. So again, Dr. Murray Bowen, the degree of resilience. So when I'm differentiated, I have a resilience. There's a contagion of anxiety in the system, but I am going to handle the anxiety with a new degree of growing maturity in the relationship system so that I am not you, you're not me, you're in anxiety, you're pushing an initiative hard, and I can zoom out and look down into the boardroom, look into my family's living room, I can look into my friendship circles, and I zoom out with kind of a Google Earth, and I can see all the pieces that are working and look at it from a much more rational perspective. When you're not differentiated, the fusion causes you then to simply believe that whatever the anxiety in the room is, is absolute truth, and we all are the slave to that truth. Think about it. I'm telling you, this is the biggest kryptonite to a leader or even into a team member. It is the biggest kryptonite that happens within organizations, whether, again, that's a family, whether it's a business, a church, a military, whatever it is. So here's another way to describe differentiation. You can think of self-differentiation as taking responsibility for the management of your own anxiety and reactivity and issues around it. Think about that. So in differentiation, I take responsibility for my emotions. In other words, I look internally. How did What just happened? Who brought the viral contagion of anxiety into my space? How is it that I then bought into it? How is it that I began to own it? How is it that I bore the burden of their anxiety and began to be a carrier of that anxiety with them? It could be that I think I'm fighting against it, but the anxiety is there causing me to fight. So in self-differentiation, as I'm maturing, I take responsibility that external factors, that other people coming into my space, they do not own the responsibility of what's happening in me. 
Welcome to the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast. My name is Patrick Norris, and I am a husband, father, pastor of 35 years, and a strategic therapeutic mentor to leaders in all arenas of life. I am an inerrantist, a Calvinist Armenian betweenist, a Holy Spirit continuist, and a finished work of Christ redemptionist. Red Ink Revival was designed to create a revival in the heart, soul, and brains of Christian leaders from all spheres of influence. Our team of pastors, psychologists, and therapists facilitate our life-changing leadership, personal growth, and emotional wholeness experiences. Our goal is to bring a revival, an integrated wholeness to pastors, church staff, the local church, and the universal Big C Church around the world. This includes marketplace leaders, educators, foster adoptive parents, and so much more. If this podcast is providing value to you, would you consider subscribing to it wherever you get your podcast? Also, please like the episodes, comment on them, and share them on your social media feeds. And one more big, big favor. If you like the show, please go review it at Apple. And if it's true of you, give us five stars. Now let's go back to this week's episode. In self-differentiation, as I mature, I have the capacity to be my individual, to be independent, to be a person who can see what's happening in my spaces and yet still keep a connection, still have an opportunity for closeness. In other words, I'm not going to be a person who in self-differentiation, I'm now not going to be the person who is completely independent, completely distant, completely detached, nor am I going to be the person who just absorbs it all and says, well, I've I've got to have closeness and I don't know what I would do or how I would survive if you don't like me, if you don't think well of me, if I disappoint you. And then you have fusion and enmeshment. And so self-differentiation is the ability to continue to grow up the scale of a pyramid and you climb this as you grow in your capacity to say, I'm not you, you're not me. What you feel is not necessary for me to feel. Now, once you do that and you can connect, you can serve somebody with empathy and adopt feeling what they feel, but you're not the slave to feeling what they feel and you're not responsible for what they feel. The fact that you're not responsible means that you can see them in their distress and have compassion on them without taking it personal, even though the rocks are often being thrown at you. And so last time we talked about this pyramid. We talked about, uh, again in review, I put up a graphic and I'll put it up again, this graphic of self-differentiation. And what we see in it, and if you're listening by audio, I want you to imagine what it looks like. The image is a pyramid-shaped triangle, and on the left side of the triangle, it represents the left leg of the triangle, which is the word individual, and it represents independence, distance, and detachment. On the right leg of the triangle is the word together, and it's the idea of closeness, fusion, and enmeshment, both of which those descriptions, what they represent, are extremes. And when you live in the extreme of either one of those, you're not going to live in human flourishing. You're going to fall apart. Your life will be a mess. You'll have anxiety everywhere you go, and you'll be wondering how you could pray cast your care upon the Lord, you could confess the word, you could declare your victory, and still you have this roaring anxiety that's got you in distress about life. So with that whole image of this pyramid in mind, the goal is to move to the top of the triangle's maturity and have less anxiety at that point. And what you have to do is to manage both your individuality, this is differentiation of self, and your togetherness in ways that promote functionality within the relationship system. And so there in the graphic is a dotted vertical midline. Again, think of a triangle with the top being at the top of the graphic, and then the base of the triangle being at the bottom of the graphic. In the middle of the bottom base is a vertical midline, and at the top point, it's at the top of the triangle. At the bottom, it's in the middle of the base. And the bottom is labeled immaturity. 
So at the base, it's immaturity. And this is a scale that we are wanting to mature in. And immaturity is referencing that you struggle with differentiation and you have more anxiety. At the top of the triangle is maturity, and this is where you have less anxiety. And there are numbers in the dotted vertical midline of the graphic, starting with zero at the bottom, that represents the immaturity. And at the top is 100, and it represents maturity. Now, what Dr. Mary Bowen believed is that he would give assessments and they would rate an individual's differentiation maturity from 1 to 100, 100 being completely differentiated and 1 being completely fused. In a family, the person with the lowest number is often the symptom bearer of family fusion. Well, what's that mean? In a family, whenever you have an individual member of the family who is not mature in differentiation, they have higher energy, higher anxiety, and they become the symptom bearer of all that is family fusion. So the family becomes fused together, and none of the members know where they begin and where they end. If mom and dad are unhappy, I'm supposed to be unhappy. If mom and dad are upside down, I need to be upside down. I'm simply a mirror reflecting the entire family. What Bowen believed is that most people stay at the differentiation level that they had when they left home, which is rarely above 60. Now, thankfully, what Bowen also taught is how to grow in maturity so that you actually are not going to be static any longer at that number. And as we tend, this is crazy, to choose our spouses and friends, we typically choose people with similar differentiation levels because of familiarity. It feels right. It feels good. They feel like what we're used to. You do realize that sometimes in relationships, what feels good is not always what's healthy. So when we talk about differentiation, differentiation is a training process. It helps a person disengage trying to change others and trying to change them uh, to trying to change themselves. I'll say it again. What differentiation is, is a training process that helps a person disengage trying to change others so that they can begin changing themselves. Maturity, as we talk this definition of maturity, what does it mean to mature? It's about becoming solid in your own sense of self or your, get this, your identity. Now in Christianity, identity is a big word. It's one that we throw around often. We say that we're identified with Christ. And yes, that's a profoundly important aspiration. But if you watch a person's life, I hope that Jesus is not identified that way. In other words, what I'm saying is that our identity is more than a religious cognition. It's more than a doctrinal statement. It's something about the way we believe and the core of our instincts. The more mature you are at differentiation, the more you are mature as a human, expressing the maturity in every relationship system, whether that's a family system an organizational system, a church system, a business system, and so on. So I want to talk today about five basic components of self-differentiation work. There's five basic components. These are five ways, five different pieces that we have to build up within ourselves to be growing in self-differentiation. And because differentiation is an art that you got to mature in. I've created an acrostic for the five components of differentiation, and the acrostic is artsy. <laughs> A-R-T-S-Y. Each one of these letters represent one of the five components to differentiation. Hopefully, it will be a, a portable handle that you can carry with you, and when you are reflecting into moments where differentiation is needed, you can think about these five components. So again, the acrostic is artsy, A-R-T-S-Y. The first three, A-R-T, the first three, art, is all about self-definition. Self-definition. How do you define you? How do you know who you are? If you're supposed to differentiate and know who you are and who you're not, who in the heck 
are you? In other words, the first three, A-R-T, is all referencing the clarity around identity. This is who you are and who you're not. Not who you aspire to be, but who you are and who you're not. And so the first, the first part of self-definition and the first part or component of a differentiated self is a person who, A, artsy, A, is aware. This is where you are aware of your emotional state. It's where you give inventory and you're able to connect the dots quickly. You're able to know what's happening on the inside of you and where you need to to correct the dots. So the first piece is awareness. A for artsy is awareness. R is responsibility. This is where you define your limits and you take responsibility for it. You don't give up the power for other people to define your limits. You define who you are and who you're not, and you commit. You take responsibility around that. So A is awareness, R is responsibility, and T is for truth. Now, truth here is not the kind of ambiguous or uh, aspiring truths that we might have. This truth is what is your transparent truth. It's what's true of you. It's the clarity of what you believe. Are you a person who sometimes thinks, you know, I believe certain things, but there's no way I would let anybody know what I believe about whatever. Well, this is where in identity you're able to define, no, this is what I believe. And if somebody disagrees with that, that's fine. But this is who I am. This is what I believe. This is how I understand life. These are my opinions. These opinions are what I have committed to. That's important. So important. So the first three pieces of differentiation that we have to grow in is our sense of awareness, the emotional state inventory. We have to be able to take responsibility. R is responsibility. This is the limits of who we are and who we're not. This is where we define ourselves. And then truth has to do with our commitment to a clarity of beliefs, a clarity of opinion. This is what I think about certain things. You may think it's stupid. I'm okay with that. I'm going to hold on to what I believe about a thing. So the first three, Awareness, responsibility, and truth of artsy. It's the art. This is all about self-definition. This is about identity, identity. The next two, which is self-regulation, the next two relate to how you emotionally are going to process as you present your identity to the world. So in every relationship system, families, businesses, churches, wherever you go, Once you have your identity clarified, now then you've got to have a component of differentiation that helps you to regulate as your emotions begin to get sparked, fires begin to happen, your brain, your your heart and soul get inflamed. So what do you do? So the next two parts or components to differentiation that are around self-regulation, and they are a part of the acrostic artsy is the first word, stand, stand, stand up. And this is a word for artsy, A-R-T, now S, stand up, around courage. This is about taking courage to be you. Taking courage not just to live internally with what you believe and think, but now then allowing somebody in appropriate time, some friendships, some relationships to see and to know you for who you really are. And then when, when they agree, they celebrate you, you have this intimacy. But when they disagree, you're able to say, I'm okay with that because I have the courage to be me. I have the courage to think what I think, to have the opinion I have. I'm not requiring you to believe my opinion. I'm going to hold on to this by standing up. Hey, have you ever wanted to explore how your backstory is influencing your present story? Have you ever wondered why you were driven the way you were driven or why you want the things you so deeply want or why you might be triggered the way you're triggered? Maybe there's something in your life that keeps derailing you or exposing the fractures in your heart and soul. At Red Ink Revival, I facilitate groups of six to 10 men 
or six to 10 ladies in an exploration process that includes worksheets, tools for discovery, and insights into personal motivations, torments, and reactions. And it's all done online through Zoom in a short six-week experience. Now don't worry, you won't be required to share anything you don't want to. Your story is yours to share when and where you're ready. But first, you owe it to yourself to know what that story actually is. Our alumni report having life-changing experiences and integrations in all spheres of life. They report it actually felt like they entered into a revival. They even say they now lead others like never before as they instinctively map their teammates' own story considerations. We're developing groups specific for individual classifications like senior pastors or spouses, church staff, educators, foster adoption parents, marketplace leaders, and churches at large. Go to redinkrevival.com and find the events tab to learn more. Which brings me to the why of Artsy. This is the fifth component, and that is the word you. Very simply, you. In other words, you hold on to you because people will disagree. People will find ways to bring energy and anxiety as a contagion onto you, and they are trying to fuse with you to get you to be manipulated or to change. So you hold on to you, you hold the line, you stay the course. In other words, you have radical acceptance of yourself even when others and groups of others don't. You hold on to yourself and you have radical acceptance of yourself, radical love and compassion to who you are even when people as individuals or groups disagree or oppose or begin to condescend and shoot relational bullets at you. So if you notice, all five of these components are focused on the self. Many times we get focused in our systems in the relationships, and we get connected in ways that cause our emotional states to get upside down. You know, when we talk to people about their marriage struggles, often the reason that a person is in distress is because, as they project, it's their marital spouse. It's their spouse in marriage. In a dating scenario, I'm frustrated with the dating partner, the partner. It's them. In a business environment, in a workflow, a person will say, my boss and they talk about the interactions with the boss. In other words, my distress is based in what my boss is doing. So in marriage, it's a spouse. In dating, it's a partner. And in work and our professional lives, it could be a boss. Maybe it's a friend. You know, I'm in distress because of my friend. My friend. I have a friend experience in what they did, what they said. And, uh, you go right down the line of all these fill-in-the-blanks. Now that I'm in distress. In other words, all that I'm describing are these external labeling, these external projections that the reason for my distress is them. The reason for my distress is not me. The reason for my distress is them. So many times we get focused on the relationships rather than focused on the self. Why is it that it distresses me? Why is it that I lose myself? Why is it that I give up pieces and parts of my uh, image of God that is in me? Why do I dishonor the very identity that God gave me to form, to develop, just because somebody else is displeased? And so self-differentiation is the ability to say, when somebody in a relationship is bringing energy, well, that's their energy. It's not my energy. And so now I can stay connected to them. I can intentionally lean back in with compassion, even if they are fighting me or accosting. Now, keep in mind that if that begins to happen where somebody is fighting or accosting you, if there's any level of abuse happening at that point, you've got to decide, you know what, I'm going to honor the image of God in me. And what that means is so that I can keep a connection, I'm going to move physically away. I'm going to remove myself from this environment. I'm going to remove myself from perhaps even the system, the way that it functions, so that I can have a heart that loves, that stays connected, that cares about an individual. So in other words, you're not going to become the victim. 
You're not going to become the person who just takes it. You're a person who says, I'm so differentiated. I now then know how to stay attached to somebody, even if I don't give them what they want. You know, a lot of times as parents get older, particularly in their 70s and 80s, they can't get enough of their adult kids and they project on their kids the anxiety, the anxiety of you don't ever come around. You're such a terrible child. Sometimes they'll throw words in about, you know, if you were a Christian like you say you are, you take care and honor your parents. The Bible says to honor your parents. Now, notice how much of that that is manipulative. And yet what they're doing is they're hurting. They're in anxiety. They're suffering. And so if you're a differentiated adult child, you can lean back in and realize that they're suffering. And yet if it is hurting or the abuse verbally is taking place in a way that it's intolerable, then you have to say, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to leave right now. And then you can talk about it with them to the level that they have capacity to do it. And if they don't have capacity, then you've got to arrange how do you stay connected to people and yet build boundaries and even create space where you don't interact with them in those ways so that you can stay healthy and strong. Over time, your tolerance, the window of tolerance gets easier and bigger for your life. However, this is a critical piece. So again, I'm just trying to emphasize that all five of the components of differentiation focus on the self. They don't focus on all the external, they focus on the internal. How you are, who you are, and how you're going to regulate. Again, I talked about the marriage spouse, the dating partner, boss interaction, friend experiences, but also church staff reactions. If you're a leader of a team and you have a, a team of members and they respond to you with high energy and telling you something looks stupid or something is off and at that moment in differentiation, you can realize, well, they're the ones with big energy. I appreciate that they care deeply about the organization, but I don't have to adopt their emotions. I can have compassion on it. I wonder what's behind it. The same with team leaders and volunteers. Uh, you know, when you have volunteers in an organization, in churches, this is common. If a volunteer has a big energy and the threat is they may leave the, the church if they don't get their way, you have to stay connected to them in a way that is healthy and functional, not abusive, but healthy and functional. You intentionally serve and care about them. At the same time, you hold on to yourself and what's best, in your opinion, for the organization, because you're the one with the responsibility for not just you, in your internal state, you're responsible for the organization and where it goes. And so every part of this is simply looking at what's happening as you work around and activate in the relationship systems. And so again, as we go into each and every one of these, we see the critical importance of being differentiated, how important that is. Now, I want us to begin to look at the first three of these five components again and do a deeper dive. You know, when we talk about these five components of self-definition, we again are dealing heavily with your sense of self, your identity. And remember, your identity, your identity was formed through the interpersonal neurobiological interactions that you had with your family of origin. Now, many people, they are like, whoa, 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 I, I, don't, I don't buy into that. Well, I promise you that it's true. <laughs> again, let me restate it. Your identity was formed through the interpersonal neurobiological interactions with your family of origin. In other words, when you were a kid, even in the first year of your life, you began to believe things about yourself on an emotional level, not a cognitive level. Your prefrontal cortex, the rational part of how you see the world, didn't actually fully develop till you're 25. But the amygdala, the emotional circuitry of the brain, uh, it actually was pretty much mature by the time you were, you were born. You came out with a lot of capacity for emotion. And your ability to adapt to mom, to dad, to siblings, and how they interact even as a baby, your eyes are looking at your mom, picking up on the nonverbal facial expressions because the eyes are connected to the vagus nerve. The ears are connected to the vagus nerve, goes all the way down uh, behind your esophagus into your stomach regions and really throughout your entire nervous system of your body. 
And when you're a baby, your eyes are looking at mom. She's relating to dad. If she's in high anxiety, dad's in high anxiety. A sibling's in high anxiety. If mom's frustrated trying to herd cats with all the other little kids in the home. And you have all of this stuff happening in the system as a baby. Your brain is already formulating how you're going to adapt in the system to mom, to dad, and to siblings. And you actually learn how to adapt to each of them in the way that they are. In other words, you learn in fusion for survival and belonging that the way that I am to function is to be pleasing or to be able to manage whatever's coming at me from the individual relationships in my family of origin. And your brain begins to build these neural pathways and adopt and adapt as necessary for survival and belonging. And what happens as an adult, you find out that there was a lot of crappy dysfunction going on in my family of origin that I have now been adapted and adopted, and I've lost who I am. And today I'm anxious about things that I shouldn't be anxious about, that somebody comes into my environment and they bring high big personality energy, and I begin to do what I learned early on. Maybe what you learned early on is that when anxiety comes in big, what you're to do is to express high amounts of emotion. Emotion. So for you, you show a lot of emotion. Maybe it's control. Maybe you learned that whenever somebody else in the family system has high, big energy, that you're supposed to control it. And what you do is you begin to control it. And as you got older, maybe you adopted new tools of power and you power over people. All because... You've lost the sense of identity, of self, who you are and who you're not, what you want, what you don't want, what you believe and what you don't believe, what your goals are and what the goals aren't for your life, what your opinions are about any given thing, and that you're able to hold on to yourself with courage and know that you're, you're, not, you're not having to be what somebody else wants you to be. And so your identity, one more time, was formed through the interpersonal neurobiological interactions with your family of origin. An identity reaches into the functions of the brain, ultimately originating in our soul, which is the immaterial part of our thinking, feeling, and consciousness. So again, I want to restate that. Our identity reaches into the functions of the brain. I just went through a mapping of how that might happen. But ultimately, believe it or not, your brain is not the be-all and end-all of you. These things originate in your soul, and your soul is the immaterial part, the non-physical part of your thinking, feeling, and consciousness. And so you cannot have a spiritual identity that you're living out of and from if your everyday family systems identity has not been rectified, has not been reformed. So when we talk about these first three components, all dealing with identity, we start again with artsy. The A in artsy is mindfulness, mindfulness uh, or awareness. It's awareness for which we mean mindfulness. So the first component of identity is awareness, being aware. Self-awareness is a vital, vital component for becoming more self-differentiated. Uh, we, we can go inward on ourselves and begin to see how we function in each relationship system. By awareness, we're able to zoom out, like I said earlier, in a Google Earth kind of way to see how each system we're in, each system we engage, how it is in operation around us. And we begin to see how we get reactive within the relationship system. So self-differentiation begins with going inward. This is awareness. Awareness is really about noticing your emotions, your own sensations, your thoughts, being aware, conscious, loops that are happening, the narratives, the reactivity, the triggers, the anxiety levels, the patterns, particularly as it relates to other people when you're functioning in the relationships or in the systems. Again, whether that's a family system, friendship system, it's a church system, a business organization system. And this work, this work of differentiation is really about seeing the bigger picture, seeing patterns, widening, widening out the lens, zooming out where we're seeing the big picture. And what it does is it helps us detach 
from the present inflamed anxiety to get relief. We begin to see it not from these nonverbal emotional powerhouse moments, but we begin to experience them from more of a rational and cognitive kind of way. So this zooming out is the reframing of what's going on. And reframing is just so crucial to our sense of self. Because reframing will change you very quickly. If you're able to step into another perspective, and uh, and if you're able to see things from a way that you've never seen it before, if you're able to change the way that you're viewing what's happening around you, amazingly enough, it'll begin to change the way you regulate yourself. And so we want to ask some various types of questions When we're trying to regulate ourselves, the word regulate just means we're managing the emotions and bringing ourselves back to a calmed, healthy, flourishing state. No longer in this distress of anxiety, but now living in peace and in joy, even if the togetherness around us is crazy. Even if you have a family member who's borderline or bipolar in in personality disorder, what you have is the ability to say other people can be crazy. I can have narcissists around me, but that doesn't mean I have to own it. So here's some questions. First question, why does this person or event trigger me? Second question, is it from a previous hurt, shame, guilt, or abandonment? This is what we're looking for. Whenever we find ourselves in distress or anxiety, we're in a triggered moment. What do they do? What do they do that triggers me on the inside? What do they do? How would you like to reboot your personal finances this year? How would you like to take control of your money, turning small wins into big results? I want to encourage you to check out my wife, Tina's financial coaching business at tinanorris.org. You might be wondering, what is a financial coach? A coach is someone who will personally team up with you to outline financial goals, inspire you with energy, help you stay focused on your goals, and so much more. You can do it all through Zoom, and she provides a free initial consultation, so there's no pain or cost to you for your first steps. Maybe you've been to several Financial Peace University cycles, left with great intentions, but struggled to execute. You need a trainer, a coach, another human that won't shame or judge you to help you stay on track. She works with clients that are single parents, everyday people, pastors and church staff, as well as high income professionals. If you have friends, church members, clients, or even young marrieds that are launching their financial lives, you will do them all a favor to have them check out this amazing option. If professional athletes need a coach to win the day to fulfill their dreams, then you and I do too. And you won't find anybody better to help you get there than Tina Norris. Set up your free consultation from anywhere in the world today. Go to tinanorris.org to find out all the details. Where does the trigger actually come from? Is it in this moment? Or could this trigger have been here for a really long time and it just came to the surface in this present relationship? You know, you have things that you develop from childhood. Maybe you had family members who never saw you. They didn't seem to search your emotions. They didn't ever find out how you're doing. You went through various abusive scenarios at school or some other environment, and nobody knew because nobody's searching you. And as an adult, they would say, I I just didn't know. I didn't know. And so today, when somebody is not noticing you or they're not asking you questions, you begin to trigger into a whole emotional spin. And so maybe, maybe the trigger in this moment that you're having in a relationship because you're not self-differentiated has been because you are learning, you're, you're seeing that these root systems of bitter moments in life are springing up and troubling you. And it's not about what happened in this relationship in the present moment. It's about what happened to me in previous relationships that built this kind of instinctual reactivity to whatever is happening even now. And so you might ask yourself this question, why why does this person matter so much to me? 
what, why, <laughs> why do I care what their emotional state is towards me? Why do I care? Why do I carry it? Now, now, when I say that, there are a lot of people who will say this, and I, I want to clarify. I don't care what anybody thinks about me. Well, I just want you to notice the anxiety that's behind that statement. <laughs> I don't care what anybody thinks about me. Well, the reality is you do care, and this is your armor. This is your escape. This is your way to tolerate the anxiety. It's not healthy. So when I say the question of why do they matter so much to me, it's a genuine question of how do you explore why this means so much to me that they are in agreement and celebration of everything I do? Can, can it be okay for them not to be happy with me? Can it be okay for them to even leave my life? And until you're differentiated to the point where you're like, it would hurt, it would hurt a lot, it would be painful, but... I want to live in a healthy, differentiated state to where I can be me. And if somebody doesn't want to be a part of that, then I want to be so healthy and flourishing that I'll go through the grief. I'll go through the pain of them leaving if that's what they need to do. But that's about them. That's not about me. Again, that's a powerful part of differentiation. You might ask yourself, why is it so important? Why, why, why would I see somebody and just give my power away to them? Why do I give up pieces of my heart and soul to somebody else just to get a very incremental return? Maybe you ask yourself, what do I fear? Why am I anxious about this? Or maybe you think, what dependency needs or issues are they activating in me? I have such needs, such issues. I'm so dependent. And what are they, what, what are, what's being activated in me around that? You might ask yourself, why am I reactive, reactive at all in this relationship? This is just great reflective questions that help surface for you the deeper reality of what's happening in your heart and soul. It helps you begin the search for identity, who you are at this state in your life. Yes, you're aspiring to be one in Christ. You're aspiring to be identified with, with Christ. However, in this moment, what is my identity? So that I can even begin to move towards the growth of being identified with Christ. I think that's so important. So how can we grow? How do we grow in maturity? How do we mature in awareness? Well, first, let's look at awareness from this whole life perspective. And here are some exercises or practices we can do to mature or become instinctual or to be consciously aware before something triggers me or you in this moment. This is the groundwork for building a healthy sense of self. If you will struggle if you will struggle with identity, who you are and who you're not, these types of exercises, we're going we're gonna to help you build the muscle that you're desiring. If you find that no matter what you do, you continually struggle to be differentiated and you continually struggle to know who you are and who you're not, well, here's some exercises. So hang on. We're going to build the muscle of self-differentiation. And so to do that, I'm going to give you three R's, three R's. And these are exercises that, again, will build awareness. The first R is to recall grievance memories. And here's the deal. To recall grievance, uh, grievance stories or previous grievance events and times you had emotional flooding that you've experienced, this is fundamental to being able to know who you are and who you're not. And let me just say this to you. If you don't know your own story, not only can you not be differentiated or live in a healthy, flourishing identity, you can't even understand what another person's identity is. If you're a leader, straight up, if you're a leader and you don't know your story, there's no way you can be healthy to lead someone else's story. And so even in Red Ink Revival, we do story work workshops. We guide clients through their own story. We use tools, assessments, worksheets to help make sense of who the clients are as a self, how they evolve to believe and feel what they believe and feel. And in the process, we discover the commonalities in their story events and show these patterns of anxiety, distress, and reactivity. 
And our alumni report that it's just one of the most life-changing online experiences that they've ever had. And they do it with six to 10 other people. So when we talk about actually recalling grievance memories, I want you to know it is impossible to have a healthy sense of self and identity if you don't know where you came from emotionally or how you evolved to be who you are today. Now, the Bible masterfully shows us character stories, right? We see who a person is, and we learn why they acted as they did. We learn of their early painful events, causes, their formations, and the patterns of reactivity. Let me give you an example. King David. We learn that King David is overlooked when the prophet Samuel comes to David's house. David's dad, Jesse, says to the prophet Samuel, he says, I have one more son out in the field. Samuel had already eliminated all the brothers in the household. And Jesse's proud of all the others. All the others, he wanted to parade them in front of the prophet Samuel because these are my boys. But then he says, Samuel's like, you got any other kids? Because none of them are it. And Jesse says, I have one more son out in the field, and he's the youngest. Now, unfortunately, modern translations don't do a good job on that word youngest. In the Hebrew, the word youngest is katan, Q-A-T-A-N, katan. And what it means in Hebrew is worthless, insignificant, and unimportant one. In other words, Jesse was ashamed of David. David knew from a young age that he wasn't measuring up to his dad. And then if you think about that, David was emotionally being formed by a father wound that no doubt plays out in the emotional projections his brothers adopted of him too. So the brothers, even when David faces Goliath, the brothers are already against him. They are embarrassed by him. They don't want him around. Now, what's that do to the psyche, the heart, the soul? on a physical level? What's it do to the brain of a person? And then on the heels of that, he does this miracle moment. God uses him to take down Goliath, and he then begins to serve King Saul. Think about the king of a nation, and you're a kid who doesn't have a healthy relationship with your father, and you have a father figure in front of you. What's wild is, is that his son, Jonathan, the king's son, Jonathan is your best friend and you're you're so connected to him. There's nothing more inside your heart and soul that you desire than to be seen, known, searched, celebrated by another father figure, King Saul, your family of origin father. He thought that you were worthless, But now you took down Goliath and you're still chasing the reality that one day maybe I can not be worthless anymore. There's this outrunning. There's this, I've got to do something. I got to perform. I got to be. He's probably dealing with all that. And King Saul, King Saul, who David so was desirous to know, King Saul tries to kill him time and time again, hates him. So David's fusion. King David, before he's a king, his fusion with his family of origin compelled him with two options. You either detach completely from your family, that's your dad and brothers, completely detach, or be enmeshed with the projections that they give to you and try to escape the fears that are around what they believe, because if, in fact, what they believe is true, it's intolerable. And so the next thing you know, you're not living in differentiation, you're fused. And of course, there's the third option that most of us were never taught or trained, and that is that we could be differentiated, to hold on to ourselves. David could hold on to healthy boundaries, while at the same time keep a connection with the family and uh, whatever healthy levels are allowed by them. But David didn't know that. So anxiety, anxiety would rumble like a Harley Davidson motorcycle right up under his heart and soul, and it would drive him to do crazy things. Maybe. Some of these crazy things could happen right after a set of worship with his harp. The dichotomy, this paradox of worship and then crazy and worship and crazy. What's happening? It's originating in a story, a family story, an emotional story. Is there any wonder that David struggled with alignment between a perfect heart before God and a crazy family life, which ends up being an affair, the murder of Uriah, and so much more. 
Even David, when he gets into his psalms, he has these imprecatory psalms that are angry and they're wanting God to kill people and he's shooting all this vile angst against God. Or his lamenting psalms where he's just depressed and sad and it's so deep. Just think about these imprecatory and lamenting psalms and how they show a heart that has never been processed with healing from the wounds of his childhood. Now, those psalms do become a part of David's grieving process back towards health. And that's why they're in the book of Psalms. However, to ignore the reality that David was in intense pain throughout his life just shows you again how that God gives us this one example of early painful events, causes, formations, patterns of reactivity. And if God wants us to know the stories of Bible characters, wouldn't he want us to know our own stories? Pastors, did you know that upwards of 70% of the men in your congregation are regularly accessing pornography, stuck in shame, torn in conflict, and therefore immobilized for zealous ministry? That's seven out of 10. The problem is not gonna go away. What are you doing to lead your men into wholeness? Porn and sex addiction is characterized by undesirable compulsive behaviors that feature incongruence with personal values and it interferes with normal living, causing stress on their relationships with God, family, friends, loved ones, and possibly even their own work environment. Well, where do you send men to recover and become both whole and integrated? Red Ink Recovery offers a unique program exclusive to porn and sex-related addictions. Our clinical professionals, our psychologists and therapists have created a transformative treatment process that collects the dots, connects the dots, and corrects the dots that have driven the addictions. Our approach heals the heart, restores the soul, and rebuilds the neuroplasticity of the brain. Our clients find their lives have been wildly marked by Christ as they are given a path for trust being rebuilt. And they are resourced for far greater relationships and intimacy than they have ever known before. All of our professional teammates are experts in the field of sexual addiction. They are all trained by Dr. Patrick Carnes and certified by the International Institute of Trauma and Addiction Professionals. Dr. Carnes is known as the father and curator of modern sexual addiction recovery as a movement. Pastors, we encourage you to recommend your men who struggle to come to one of our intensives. If you are a, just a simple man that struggles, maybe you're new to the faith or you don't even know what you believe about Christ, be encouraged to join us. We will honor your journey and give you the tools to live in wholeness. To find out more about our porn and sex addiction intensives and when the next one is, go to redinkrevival.com. So first, if you're wanting to grow in your sense of differentiation, your identity, you're going to have to reflect on previous memories of loss, grief, and trauma. Reflect on grievous moments that have happened in your life from your mom, your dad, your siblings. It could be things in relationship. It could be things that happen just in circumstances, car wrecks, natural disasters, etc. But there have been grievous moments that most of us we were taught to just run faster, to try harder, to work more so that we could beat it. We could win over it. And no matter what we do, we can't seem to get away from it. And the anxiety lurks. It just stays there. It rumbles until we end up doing crazy things. And generally, the crazy things that we do are when we least expect it. So when we talk about our first part of these R's, the R's of growing and maturity, we recall grievance memories, grievance memories. But we also, number two, is we reflect on event feelings. So capture this. Once you look at your grievous moments and you begin to think about what they are, now reflect on and associate what you were feeling in that event moment. Now, I know that for some of us, this is new and it feels like this is exhausting. 
And it's probably because we've never built stamina around our emotions so that anytime we have to face an emotional experience, we just want to go take a nap. And grief in and of itself is filled with protest. Uh, Our bodies don't want to experience grief because in grief, we lose control when we lose control. Because you, when you cry, you ever seen somebody who's in a moment, they feel the surge of a cry and they begin to cry and they apologize. Well, why are they apologizing? It's because they feel grief. They've lost control. They feel vulnerable in this space. And in that vulnerability, their brain says, you've lost control. This isn't good. Do what you have to do to get control again. And so... It's important that we reflect on grievous events that have happened in our childhood that have built into us coding, programming for how we live and relate today. Sometimes we can manage it with white knuckle discipline until we can't, until the least expected moment and we're triggered and it's like a bullet coming from a gun and we're like, how'd that happen? I don't know how it happened. So reflect and associate What you were feeling in those event moments. My encouragement is, is that if you take these grievous moments, just take a few of them, write them down. You can do it in an electronic document, like a Word document, but write down what those are. Write down some of the events that have happened in your life that have high intensity of emotion in them. And then in this number two, reflect on event feelings, reflect and associate a feeling to the event moment as the event happened. And you can begin by scanning what you are emotionally experiencing right now as you go back in your imagination to the event. Maybe imagine what people said or what the bodily and facial expressions were or what feelings and emotions that would come to surface here. What you want to do is you want to get in touch with the emotions and the feelings that are surfacing as you went through some of the events of your life that caused grief, loss, sorrow, trauma. And when you do, you're going to begin to see a picture. Now, you may be wondering, well, how do I go about this? Well, how do I find what my feelings and what my emotions are? Well, the first thing that I would encourage you to do is to routinely, routinely review a list of emotions or feelings. And you can do that with what is a searchable phrase or word, two words, feelings wheel. A feelings wheel is an online tool that is just a big circle. In fact, I'll throw it up on the screen. It's a big circle that has feelings and emotions that are in it, and they give you descriptive words around it. And what it does is they are associated words to events that happened in our lives. And as we are able to fill in with more of these feelings and emotional words, we begin to be aware, aware. Remember artsy, artsy? The first piece of your identity is being aware of what's going on in you. You cannot grow an identity. You can't even adopt the identity of Christ beyond just by faith, I believe I am what he says I am. You can't live from an emotional state of that until you have gone back and you have identified what's happening in you. You're aware of the emotions that take place. And so if you're going to mature in your emotions and your instincts, you're going to have to identify in what's happening in you. And by revisiting or routinely reviewing the feelings well, uh, we'll, you'll be able to identify your feelings in real time as they happen because you're practicing them. It's critical to your sense of self so that you know what you're emoting and feeling in any given moment. This is a part of being aware. It demonstrates consciousness. Now, some people have emotions and feelings that they can identify, and they can, they can fill an entire sheet with it. But they don't know what they mean. They don't know what they mean. So it's so important that we begin to clarify, first and foremost, with an awareness, what emotions and feelings do I have? Then we'll begin to decipher what do they mean. Well, there's some people that they have these emotions and feelings they identify, and they do. They just, they could fill a whole sheet up with what they're feeling. There's other people, get this, who are the opposite. They're completely blank, (laughs) and they feel incompetent to know what they are feeling at any given moment. Now, even those people who don't know what they feel at any given moment, this is a powerful uh point to stop and pause and say, 
I wonder with curiosity why it is that I don't know what I feel. Because somewhere you have an emotional reactivity from your childhood up that you learn to adapt to the family systems, the relationship systems of your life, that whenever you have feelings to stuff them and to disengage them because feelings are not safe, which incidentally requires an emotion, a feeling to be able to stuff. I just think that's interesting. So we do have this feelings wheel, and it's a great list online that you can print. Just Google search feelings wheel. It's a tool that I've used for so many of my years of recovery and, and health and strength. As many of you know, I dealt with a lot of panic attacks in my life, and I didn't know that I was even having a panic attack, but they got severe on a few occasions. And uh, a feelings wheel was a big part of my process of learning what's happening in me so that I could identify where it's coming from, the meaning of it, and then be able to address it with truth and then reframe it, reprocess it, and return to a place of peace, a regulated emotional state. So I, today, even now, I still refer to the feelings wheel as I reflect on difficult seasons. There are a lot of different versions of this feeling wheel on the internet. If you put feelings wheel in Google, you're going to see a bunch of them. Uh, find one that works well for you. The one that I featured on your screen has a larger list of each category's feelings. And so, uh, again, take a look at it. As you can see in the middle, if you're watching on YouTube, if you're listening uh, by our podcast audio, you can just hear that you have three concentric circles. A concentric circle is you have an inner circle, one more circle beyond that, one more circle beyond that. In the most inner circle are these seven words, bad, and it's green, and then it fans out into the other two concentric circles with words like bored. Bad means bored, busy, stressed, tired. And then in the outermost circle, indifferent, apathetic, pressured, rushed, overwhelmed, out of control, sleepy, unfocused. All of those are green and they represent words that are synonymous or descriptive of bad. Then you have another word, fearful. It does the same thing with multiple words, angry, it does the same thing with its own words in kind of a, a pinkish red. And then you have a gray area that's disgusted. And it fans out with all of its descriptive words. You have a word that's sad, all of its descriptive words, all of happy, and the same with surprise. So you have all these different words that fan out to multiple definitions and multiple emotional or feeling states. And so use this, pull it out. And as you're looking at your grievous events that have happened in your life and you're recalling them, think about what emotions did I feel in those moments? Now, you may be thinking, I didn't like living through it the first time. I don't want to go back and live through it a second time. But what you're going to find out is for the brain to restore from grief in grievous moments, it can't be stuffed. It's got to be processed forward process forward. In other words, when you were a kid, you didn't have the tools or the resources to be able to healthfully flourish even in the midst of abusive or painful moments. But as an adult, and even now, as you follow along with Red Ink Revival or other therapeutic sources, you're going to find how that you can process that forward and become whole, because otherwise you're going to be like the proverbial person who takes a beach ball, shoves it under the pool water, and you think that you're managing it. But we all know what happens whenever you put a beach ball under the, the pool water. Uh, before too long, you're going to mismanage it, and the thing's going to surprise you and fly right out of the water and spray everybody around. Well, that's what you do when you stuff grief. My experience, just in case you wondered, is as a therapeutic coach to so many, when I see somebody in their 20s, they don't even know. They don't even know what's happened in their lives. They don't know what they stuffed. It's usually not until a person gets to somewhere between the age of 35 and 40 does their history come forward and the grief that's unprocessed the memories that I haven't been dealt with are now then going to come up out of the water of life, just like that beach ball. So no matter what age you are, it would do you good to actually do your story work. So again, 
For some people, it, uh, or for all of us, it's important that we begin with knowing what our emotions are in any given moment. So we go back to our history and we begin to say, this emotion was happening in that moment. And in fact, when you take several of your grievance story events, several of them, and begin to associate emotions, you're going to find that those emotions are going to create a pattern, a profile that actually represent what you typically live in probably today. Another thing you can do in this uh, idea of becoming aware and uh, finding out what emotions are happening in you is to find an emotionally intelligent guide, a guide, a person, a partner. For some people, it's just so helpful to have a guide, a counselor, a friend that is emotionally intelligent to help search your storied events. And by them asking questions around your emotions, you're going to find that there's so much more there that could have been surfaced and you couldn't have done it on your own. You couldn't have surfaced it without their help. Now, some people, again, as I said a minute ago, they'll say, I don't feel anything. Well, that's a great place to explore. It isn't a dead end. You got to know that. It's not a dead end. A person that doesn't feel anything has an emotional protection system that's employed to armor them up, to stuff or to suppress and this is a great place to start having curiosity. Interestingly enough, it is. I said this earlier. It is emotional happening that's compelling the person to not feel. So again, those are some ways to get a guide to help you surface what emotional experiencing you're having, what feeling experiencing there is. Then what you can do is also journal. These are all ways to build the maturity muscle of awareness. You can begin to journal, to journal. So when we journal, we can begin discovering the feelings, the emotions, the thoughts, and the meanings of our life. So when we journal, we can go to a private place and turn on some favorite soothing music and then begin journaling about the storied events that have brought about grief in our life. Write out what we've been experiencing and go into detail of what we felt and how it impacted us in our sense of self. Now, again, by doing this, we're simply tuning in and becoming sensitive to awareness. And awareness is a precursor to being differentiated, and differentiation requires us to have a healthy sense of identity. And so I, I personally, for me, I, I journal. I journal. I, I write things in a prayer. I start with Dear God in a, an electronic document, a Word document. Now, you need to know my theology, my, my foundation theologically allows for me to be brutally honest without disappointing the Lord. So if your theology is one that you think God could be ticked at you at any given moment, or he's sad, he's disappointed, he's frustrated, you're the child that he loves, but he doesn't like, he's irritated with you, that whole deal. If you have any of that in your theology, this might not work for you. But my theology, my foundation allows for me to be brutally honest without feeling this, this threat of disappointing the Lord. I can share personally my fears, my doubts, my pains, my anger. I can even be angry at God without filters, without feeling like I have crossed some line in the relationship or that, uh, that God will be disgusted with me because of my emotional frailty. No, my theological foundation's unshaken because I know that God loves me. He likes me. He gets me. He knows me. He's always in a good mood to me. So much uh, theological static happens for people because they use human emotions or human interpretations and rationale experiences, and then they project them onto God. However, many of these, these suppositions of, you know, I'm projecting this stuff on God, of being disappointed with me. They're actually impossible for God. In other words, God doesn't interact with the experience the way that we project it on him. Because, again, he's God, and they're impossible to him. You're like, I don't know where you're going with this. Well, hang on. Here's an example. For God to be disappointed in me, for God to be disappointed in me, he has to not <laughs> be omniscient. He can't know everything. Because if God knows everything and he's eternal, He's eternal. In other words, he's, he's outside of time. He doesn't live within the confines of time. He knows everything perfectly, past, present, and future. God would have to be in constant disappointment from eternity past because he knew in his omniscient, his all-knowingness, he knew about my failures. 
And again, because he's outside of time, there's nothing hidden from him from eternity past. So at what point did he get disappointed? Did he get disappointed in me at the point in which I prayed? Or is he disappointed in me from all eternity past? And if that's the case, how does he manage all that? Not just me, but all the billions of people on the planet and all the billions of people that have lived throughout history. And then he's always having to deal with disappointment and sadness, frustration from us. Can you see for a minute that we anthropomorphize God? We put on God human experiences, and then we try to make sense of it with our human frameworks and interpretations. Let me break in one more time and tell you about RedInkRevival.com. That is R-E-D-I-N-K Revival.com. I want to encourage you to go there and sign up for our blog e-newsletter. Is every month it will hit your inbox with a blog post and new special events that will ink your soul with revival. So most of the time, in my opinion, people who feel God's disappointment in them, it's actually their own disappointment in themselves. I'll let there be a pregnant pause. Most of the time, people who feel God's disappointment in them, it's actually their own disappointment in themselves. God, on the other hand, he knows why we do what we do and is able to hold justice and empathy together. So I can journal and be honest and fully transparent in my emotional writing to God and know I'm engaging grace and not judgment. Think about it. Many times when I write these prayers, I'll come to very painful moments uh, of relationships or just dreams that are unfulfilled. And I'll simply invite God to sit with me. I invite Jesus to feel what I feel. He's touched with the feeling of my infirmity. I want him to feel it. Why do I want him to feel it? See, I'm not looking for a fix. I want him to embody the moment with me. That's what intimacy is. It's I'm seen, I'm heard, I'm known. And so I sit with him and he sits with me in, in a painful moment. Now, I'm not looking for a fix in this moment. I'm looking for relationship. I'm looking for connection. I'm looking for somebody who cares about me. Now, after I have this moment of connection where I am felt, I'm heard, I'm fully known for who I am and what I'm experiencing, then I may move forward and ask him what he thinks about me. What he thinks about this moment? What he thinks about the bond that I have with him? And what I'm looking for, not words, I'm just looking for heart that he is holding me in, that he's caring for me with, that he's loving me with a, a love that Ephesians chapter 3 says in, it's incomprehensible. But I'm, I'm opening myself to, to experience the love of God. And uh, I'm simply wanting to be one with him in my emotional suffering. Now, ultimately, yes, I'm, I'm going to walk uh, with the Lord in the truth of what he did in redemption. And by walking with him in the truth of what he did in redemption, faith arises. And yes, there's fixes. Yes, there is overcoming. Yes, there's more than conquerings. But for my emotional self to be whole, I can't speed past the emotional wounds that have happened throughout my life. I've got to have his empathy to bring wholeness, to reprocess the memories. And I need other humans to do that. So again, my framework is imagining God's unwavering compassion and grace, never allowing a thought of judgment, criticism, and disappointment to settle in on me. Um, I, I want to sit with the Holy Spirit's presence in, in my imagination as one that brings me supernatural comfort, strength, advocacy, and more. I just think it's interesting that most people that I come into contact with, when they imagine the Holy Spirit sitting with them in moments of grievance, they think of him of judging them, of criticizing them, of some way or other sharing disapproval. That's not, that's not the way I approach it. It's not the theology I have. So when you're journaling, when you're journaling, you might ask yourself, if I could be heard and understood and I could write anything, what would I write? What would I write if I had no fear of what would happen with anyone else's reactions? That's a great way to just begin to get down into your feelings. So on a sheet of paper or this electronic document, write down the list of emotions and feelings that you felt in that one grievance of it, and then do it over and over. 
And when you do this exercise over several grievance events, you're going to begin to see an emotional pattern. As I've said before, a profile is going to emerge. So number one, you recall the grievance memories. Number two, you reflect on event feelings. This is about building the muscles of awareness. And then number three, number three is you recognize associated narratives and meanings. So in step three, we grow in this awareness as we take a single grievance event with the emotions and feelings that have been identified, and then we ask deeper questions. What are these emotions telling me? What are they trying to inform me of? Some people have emotions and people will say, don't be led by your emotions. Well, it depends on what you mean by that. If you understand that emotions are supposed to be gauges that give you input, they help you understand things around meaning and your identity and sense of self, yes, you need to explore them. But if what you're saying is, is that whatever you're emotionally experiencing or whatever you're feeling in the moment, that is your final and authoritative truth, well, obviously that would not be healthy. There's a lot of emotions that I have at any given minute. Some minutes I have emotions that tell me that I need to eat a whole dozen Krispy Kreme donuts. Well, that doesn't mean it's going to be healthy for me, right? The point is, is that what these emotions are doing is they're trying to inform me. They're gauges that give me information. They're informing me of something in my life. So let's begin with the narratives. Our search begins with inner narratives. What are the looping thought scripts that are surfacing in, in my mind? I, I want to find the most exact inner statements that I'm, I'm thinking. What is it? I'm going to be conscious. I'm tuning in to these statements and know what the most exact inner statement is. What is the statement? What are they? Another approach that you can have on this narrative uh, research is... Ask this question, what did I begin to believe about myself? When the event happened, what did I begin to believe about myself? Or scan for these statements that are happening in your life. And you got to determine, this is so important, determine to do it with no self-judgment, no embarrassment, no filtering, and refuse to fall into the trap of what I should be thinking right now is. So what did I begin to believe about myself? That's the question. What did I begin to believe about myself in these events? Maybe you are having these kind of resurfacing narratives. I'm so stupid. Or I'm a fraud. If people just knew the real fragile nature of who I am, they would never trust me again. Or maybe I'm in, invisible and nobody, nobody cares about me. Nobody gives a rip about me. So what did I begin to believe about myself? What are these associated narratives to the feelings and emotions I just began to look at when the event happened, this is the emotion I felt, and these are the different words I associated from the feelings wheel. But now then, what are the narratives that are connected to that, that are a part of that emotion? What is this that's looping in my, my head? You know, some people, it may be things like if I give someone vulnerability, they're just going to exploit it and me. Or I, I just have to do better. I just have to do better to be accepted and to have any of my dreams fulfilled. I just got to do better. So everything now is built on doing better, and yet you know your flaws and imperfections better than anybody. So it's just a, trif uh, a trifle, it's just a, uh, an overwhelming flood of anxiety that you stay in a, you know, a hurricane swirl of, right? Or how about this interstatement? People will leave if I don't offer enough to keep them here. And the enough is in quotations. People are going to leave me if I just don't offer enough to keep them here. I got to be funnier. I got to provide more service. I got to, you got to, I got to, I got to. And then in these emotions and feelings, uh, we should actually go back to the sheet that we created and that we are writing, whether it's electronic or hard copy. And let's log the, uh, the emotions and feelings, as we've said, write down the narratives, these self-talk statements to the grievance event, and learn to do this over and over in your life so that every time you have an emotion, you can begin to associate a narrative. There are narratives. There's these self-talk loops that are connected to those emotions. And it's so important that we learn how to be aware, to be aware. And you only are going to be aware by exercise, by practice. 
you begin to see this narrative pattern that comes up. It seems to be the same for one individual, for one person. The same narrative seems to strike cycle over and over. It's a profile, this emergence of thought. Again, I'm so stupid. I'm just so stupid. It's always my fault. So you you maybe do things to harm yourself, or maybe you do things that are lashing out at everybody else because you can't tolerate the war on the inside of you. So you look at that narrative. And then when you look at the narratives, it's so important that you move to the next stage of it, and that is you find out what the meaning is. Once you've identified the most exact interstatements, beginning asking yourself, what's the meaning of this statement to me? In other words, behind every interstatement is a meaning, a meaning. So you have an emotion. The emotion is connected to an interstatement, a narrative, and that narrative is something for which you have made meaning out of. And listen, meaning is where energy begins to control you. Energy begins to drive you. It's in how you make meaning of who you are, who the people around you are, and what's going to happen next in your life. When we have a thought like, I'm so stupid, I'm just so stupid, that means something to us in the broader picture of a perceived survival and belonging. I'm so stupid is a statement that can mean, if I'm stupid, people won't want to be around me, and if people don't find interest in me, or they lose interest, or they reject me, or maybe they betray me, I don't know if I can survive. So what we learn then is that our emotions and feelings overall in life are connected to these narratives and beliefs about ourselves. I'm sad because I think I'm stupid. If I'm stupid, I won't belong. If I don't belong anywhere, I'm not going to survive. So at the root of this whole emotional tree is anxiety around belonging and surviving. So what we have to do is dispute it. A healthy process forward is to know what the emotions are. Then we connect those to the narratives that became a part of us, these beliefs, if you will. And then the meaning, the meaning behind it, what it means to us, our deep core beliefs, the emotional sense of self. And we have to dispute, dispute the beliefs and narratives. In other words, a lot of times we have these meanings, these deep-seated beliefs, emotional beliefs, identity beliefs about ourselves. We have them that are so cemented on the inside of us, and yet when we rationally look at them, we realize they're not even true. So we have to dispute or we have to reframe and give room for new meaning to our lives with new beliefs. So an example of disputing would be asking ourselves, do I know anybody who was considered a lower IQ, who loved life, had a good marriage, was a good parent, and made a good living in life. Well, think about that. Slow down. If you're a person who has this heavy, dominating self-hatred around, I'm so stupid, I'm so stupid, and it actually roots down into that I can't belong and I can't survive, which is where it always comes back to, As it comes back to that, then uh, you ask yourself, do I know anybody? What you're doing is you're disputing, you're reframing. Do I know anybody who has been considered to have a lower IQ, who loved life, who had a good marriage, was a good parent, and or had a good living, a good financial state of life? And here's what's crazy. If I can just think of one person, the mind will begin to reprocess the threat level, and then the anxiety begins to diminish. There is a lot more that we could talk about in disputing narrative meanings, but that will have have to come at at another time. Point being is that the anxiety is actually because of a flawed sense of self, a flawed identity. And that's because we've never slowed down to be aware of all the systems that are firing off, how the computer inside of us is working, how our brains are functioning, how our heart and soul, the immaterial part of us, how it began to develop in form. So important that we consider this stuff. So in wrap up on this stage of recognizing associated narratives and meetings, log your list of previous grievance events, then log your list of associated emotions and feelings. Start with a grievance, 
and the event, the memory, and then you associate emotions and feelings that you felt when it happened. And then you begin to write down the self-talk scripts that happened in that moment. And even today, what you might have around that as you recall it. And then write down the meanings of each narrative. Follow the meanings all the way down to the root of survival and belonging. And you begin to ask again and again and again after each meaning, then what does that mean to me? So when you have the narrative, you ask, what does that mean to me? And then whatever the answer to what does that mean to me, you ask it again. What does that mean to me? And what does that mean to me? Until you get down to the anxiety that is at the root of survival and belonging. Now, I do want you to know, if you're wondering, does this have anything to do with kind of crazy behavior? It has everything to do with it. Do you know that in addiction recovery, and we'll go specific to sexual addiction recovery, with people who are incapable of managing their compulsive desires for sexual activity, do you know that we say that all sexual addiction is rooted in an anxiety disorder? What are we talking about? We're talking about how differentiation brings us to human flourishing. That's what we're talking about. So, we write down the meanings of the narratives and we say, what does that mean? And then what does that mean right on down the line? And then we gift ourselves with real life examples that dispute the anxiety around survival and belonging. And you can do it again by thinking of real life examples. If I can think of one person that is living in a reality that's different than my deepest anxiety and fear of what's going to happen to me, that nobody will love me, I'm going to be alone, I'm going to be old, I'm going to be uh, by myself, and I won't have anything to laugh or have joy about. Ask yourself, do I know one person who fits whatever the threat narrative is that has actually lived a different life? And your brain will begin to let go of some of that pain. And then you can move to scriptural truth and ask yourself, what does the Bible say about who I am? And reframe, reframe how you see yourself and your future. Now, when you do these exercises over several grievance events, you're again, I've said it over and over, you're going to begin to see narrative meeting, uh, narrative and meaning patterns, a profile, and they're all going to, you could have an emergence of, of things that you're going to be like, oh my gosh, this is, this is like my personality. And we're going to help you become refreshed, renewed, restored, this process is going to help you become aware at all times what your triggers are and the underlying beliefs that you've grown to attach to them. And so again, the three R's are recall grievance memories, reflect on event feelings, and recognize associated narratives and meanings. This is self-differentiation component number one of artsy. It's the A. It is awareness. All of these help you mature in the identity of awareness. Now, one more time in review. When we talk about self-differentiation, it begins with self-definition or identity. Artsy is our acrostic. A is awareness. R is responsibility. T is truth. All of that refers to your sense of self. It's your identity. Then you present yourself in the final two components of differentiation, and that is around self-regulation. That is stand, stand. Artsy, the S at the end, stand uh, this is the courage to be you. And then finally, you, you is the why of artsy. And this is where you hold on to you. It's you have a radical acceptance of you even when others do not comply. Now we're going to go next week in continuation with the remaining four components of self-differentiation. That's all for today. I hope you find this podcast episode helpful in all of your life. We're creating wholehearted leaders through theology, psychology, and neuroscience. If you're a pastor and you desire to do this work for your staff, I'd love to partner with you in this work. I'm guest speaking on Sundays as well as providing separate life-changing leadership, personal growth, and emotional wholeness experiences for you and your staff. Reach out and we can customize our products or our service packages to whatever context you have. You can reach me at Norris, N-O-R-R-I-S, dot Patrick at gmail.com. You guys have a great week. We'll see you next time.